awfully small. I'd say it's awfully cozy. That's dilapidated. Rustic. That house is on fire. Motivated seller. Housing is in trouble in the United States. With record home prices, increases in the cost of rent, rampant homelessness, and the deepening issue of inflation, the prospect of owning a home or even just having some semblance of housing security is increasingly tenuous. In June of 2022, the median cost of a home reached $416,000, a 13% increase since June of 2021. Further, the problem of housing shortages that once largely plagued cities has been steadily creeping across the nation, a fact not at all affected by massive investment firms like BlackRock buying up homes, including about 15% of the market in the first quarter of 2021, at least not according to trusted media sources. But what we do have some evidence of is that, at least as of March, of 2022, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas released a report stating that U.S. market trends were indicative of a new housing market bubble brewing. And inevitably, bubbles are wont to burst. Although the authors concluded that we're not headed for a similar market crash as that which occurred in 2008, at least in terms of magnitude, if trends remain consistent, eventually something's gotta give. So with rising housing costs in mind, and the fact that if trends continue, a large portion of millennials and Gen Z may never own a home, we should understand the effects of home ownership, if any, on our lives. While plenty of people report preferring to rent for any number of reasons, such as having a landlord who maintains the building or being able to live in urban areas closer to work and entertainment, are there any other benefits to home ownership? Namely, does having a home make people happier? But first, and because just like protecting your home, it's important to protect yourself online, let me tell you about this video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark allows you to quickly change your location to protect your browsing history from companies and entities that might be interested in tracking your data. Surfshark's clean web feature also blocks ads, malware, and trackers to both help keep you safe and make your browsing experience better. You can also use Surfshark to help get great deals on products that might be more expensive based on your region, which is really useful when shopping for home accessories. Changing your location also allows you to have access to countless TV shows and movies not available where you live. For example, Shudder, a streaming service for horror movies and shows, is not available where I live. But I love horror, so I wasn't going to let that stop me from accessing all the content that I'm, you know, paying for. Which is where Surfshark comes in. With Surfshark, I can simply use their browser extension to change my area to someplace better suited for scares, like Detroit. And voila, now I can access Shudder. If you want to protect your privacy and access media from all over the world, click the link in my description and get 83% off a three-year plan with Surfshark VPN. That's just over $2 a month, and you get protection for all of your devices by using my code Aiden, that's A-Y-D-I-N. So now that you've got plenty of fun films and shows to watch from the comfort of wherever you call home, let's talk about home ownership and happiness. A better idea of the influences of home ownership on a number of psychological and social outcomes, we can look to a review of literature from Dietz and Howren, 2003, which is perhaps a bit dated now, but still worth a gander just to check out the broader findings at that time. And given that this is a review, I will be deferring to Dietz reporting on individual studies rather than going through each study one by one. We'll be going into more detail on all of these issues later, but I figure why not cover the key points right away before we get down deep in the dirt with the data, at least in terms of those studies conducted largely in the 2000s and later. To begin with, a study from Rossi and Weber 1996 was indicative that home ownership was associated with higher household life satisfaction and happiness, but it's not just life satisfaction that was affected, as research from Benzaval and Judge 1996 found that home ownership was positively associated with physical, mental, and emotional health in general. Utilizing data from the U.S. General Social Survey, or GSS, Deepas, Deepas, Growly, Deep, God damn it. What's your name? Dace? <laughs> DePascal and Glaser, 1998, found that home ownership was also correlated to a number of social variables, including membership in non-professional organizations, that is, something like a homeowners association or a neighborhood watch, not an organization that is just not very professional. <laughs> knowledge of local officials, an important bit of knowledge to have, to be fair. <laughs> Voting in local elections, involvement with solving community problems, church attendance, and gun ownership, 
all of which indicate that homeowners tend to be more involved in the goings-on of their locale, and one thing that often comes in tandem with social involvement is social capital. Social capital is a form of non-monetary currency that is accrued by contributing positively to various social relationships. Say you have an apple tree, and it produces far more apples than you could eat alone, so you give your neighbor some of the excess. This small act builds social capital, such that the next time you're in need of some assistance, for example, doing some renovations in your home, the neighbor may feel more inclined to pay it forward and assist you if you ask for help, or maybe just drop by with a bottle of cider sometime, made from those excess apples. Hi, we need to sell stuff to the black market. What? Get out of here before I call the cops on you goddamn racists! But we're selling apples! Apples? Well, you should have said so earlier! Again, no money was exchanged here, nor were any agreements signed. Instead, social capital is an often non-spoken value of community credit. As such, by having more social capital via engagement with the community, homeowners thereby are more able to leverage that capital to gain various forms of assistance from said community. Because homeowners are often more involved then, it should come as little surprise that according to data from Dreyer 1994, the homeowner voting rate is 69%, nice, while the renter voting rate is just 44%. An older study from Glum and Kingston, 1984, found that homeowners were more likely to support the status quo, participate in voluntary organizations, and interact in informal social networks. Similarly, Cox, 1982, reported that homeowners were more likely to participate in local political activity and voice dissatisfaction to local government and political agencies, something the Dutch government was made well aware of in 2022. One of the reasons for these findings may be that homeowners, due to their very visceral investment in their locale, are thereby concerned with maintaining their home's value and try to improve the environment around them. Your fly is down. It's my yard. Which we can see evidence of in research from South and Crowder 1997, who reported that homeowners were significantly less likely to relocate away from a distressed neighborhood. After all, renters may actually be incentivized to decrease the value of their community, if only for the purpose of lowering their own rent. Busts and shuts in the sky, so the housing prices are not as high. Zillow cook all of the books, so we keep the rent low. Further along these lines, the Stein hypothesis proposed in a 1995 piece argues that homeowners will delay a move during periods where in-home prices are low even if they may desperately want to move, simply because of the capital loss that would be incurred, instead holding onto homes that they wish to sell while saving for a move during periods of depression in the housing market. The ultimate result, then, is that homeowners often have lower mobility than do renters, and their mobility is more strongly tied to economic conditions. Further, despite the problem of reduced mobility, homeownership does offer other significant benefits, including lower incidents of violent assault, as found in an analysis of FBI crime statistics from Glaser and Scaredote, 1999. This assessment, however, found no relationship between home ownership and robbery, nor with So with that in mind, let's delve a little deeper into the data in greater detail, beginning with what appears to be one of the most consistent findings about home ownership, and that's its relationship to life satisfaction. There's an idea I see occasionally proliferated that all homeowners are rich, Scrooge McDucks, and if that were the case, well, duh, of course, homeowners are happier than non-owners, they're just wealthier, and hence happier. But things really aren't quite that simple, not only because money doesn't buy happiness, but because home ownership also comes with a lot of financial stress not faced by renters. As previously mentioned, renters have a higher level of mobility to move out of a crappy apartment that they dislike, but problems with an apartment are generally not left up to tenants to ameliorate, that instead falls into the lap of landlords, for better or for worse. But for homeowners, the buck really does stop with them on fixing problems with the home, and that can mean spending a lot of money. So why is it that our quick survey of findings from the 80s and 90s seems to illustrate that homeowners are happier and healthier than renters if they also have this increased financial burden? If it was all up to money and the exorbitant wealth that homeowners supposedly have, then why would those owners also be so reluctant to sell their homes on the cheap when the housing market was in decline, if they wanted to get away from a negative situation? Why not just eat the cost? 
Well, Diaz Serrano 2009 sought to detangle the relationship between housing status and life satisfaction using data from the European Community Household Panel collected between 1991 and 2004, which included information on subject socioeconomic status, demographic information, health, migration, labor situation, income and life satisfaction, as well as specifics of the subject's home, detailing the type of dwelling, a flat or a house, the number of rooms, existence of an indoor flushing toilet, usually something less of a concern in most areas outside of India and San Francisco. Who are you? Sergeant Schwinkter of the Dirt Patrol. Our mission, to keep America clean. And when the job gets this dirty, there's only one weapon, new napalm olive. Hot running water, presence of a terrace or garden, shortage of space, inadequate heating facilities, leaky roof and damp walls or floors, noise, pollution and environmental problems in the neighborhood, crime or vandalism issues, duration of residence, household size, household costs, and concerns with finances. Housing costs were assessed in two ways, one using a relative measure comprised of the percentage of income devoted to paying monthly rent or mortgage and self-reported financial burden regarding housing. Diaz Serrano broke down participants in this analysis into two general groups, movers, those who changed their domicile at some point during the data collection period, and stayers, those who remained in the same residence over time. Stayers tended to have lower reported health than movers, but this may be because the average age of stayers was about 49, while the average age for movers, both before and after their move, was 40. Those who stayed in a single home over time tended to have achieved a higher level of education and were slightly more likely to be married. Movers tended to have higher incomes, which also may be partly explained by the somewhat older average age of stayers, who may be in the process of leaving the workforce. However, both groups spent almost identical percentages of their income on paying for their home. The percentage of respondents who declared that their finances had improved in the last year was higher among movers than in stayers. However, overall, homeowners were more satisfied with their situation than were renters, both for movers and for stayers, and satisfaction increased after transitioning from renting into home ownership. Take it nice, make the fifth law, spicy painting, make it buy you, you doing? In the full sample, Diaz Serrano's first model was illustrative that homeowners, those with larger incomes as well as improvements in income, were all positively related to life satisfaction. While in contrast, household size, housing costs as a financial burden, and deterioration of income were all negatively related to satisfaction. For homeowners, the relationship between the percentage of income dedicated to paying rent was an inverted U curvilinear one. Wait a minute, an inverted U? That would make it an... Oh no! You have been banned Remember, from this Ubisoft right, forum recently. Like, we. <laughs> <laughs> Such that the richest homeowners and the poorest contribute far less of their average income into paying for their home than those in between. While for renters, the relationship was positive and linear, meaning that the more a renter earns, the more they tend to pay for their apartment or home. Most individual characteristics were unrelated to life satisfaction, with a few exceptions. One being health, which was positive and linear, that is, healthier people are also happier, unsurprisingly, and age, which formed an inverted U, meaning the oldest and youngest people tended to be the least satisfied. As we might expect, having basic amenities and not experiencing housing space restrictions were positively related to satisfaction, while poor housing conditions, deprivations, and living in a bad neighborhood were negatively related to satisfaction. Those who lived in homes tended to be more satisfied than those who lived in flats, and positive effects of living in a house on satisfaction are more than twice that effect in owners than in renters. The results of Diaz Serrano's second model were indicative that becoming a homeowner was not only consistently related to increased satisfaction, but more specifically, the impact of amenities and utilities was reduced, such that having more amenities produced less satisfaction and having fewer amenities produced less dissatisfaction in homeowners compared to renters. And his third model further illustrated that this effect was more pronounced in movers relative to stayers. And that makes sense, as for a lot of movers, they were moving into their first home, hence the stronger effect of increased satisfaction and decreased influence of amenities and utilities on that satisfaction. To simplify, if you own a home, you don't have to fill it with as many possessions to be happy. Ah uh, yes, the classic Elden Ring gamer setup. What more could a guy need? At the same time, however, becoming a homeowner as a variable explained all variance in changes in housing satisfaction for stayers, but just under 35% of variance of the increase in housing satisfaction for movers. That is, although buying a home unilaterally increases satisfaction, 
Because movers may be transferring from one owned home to another, the increase in happiness is not as strongly correlated to potentially upgrading from one home to a different one. Instead, owning a home itself was a far more robust predictor of satisfaction. Further analysis of the influence of mobility on satisfaction revealed that home ownership is at least as important as improving the housing characteristics in determining housing satisfaction. To summarize then, yes, it seems that homeowners are happier even if they have fewer amenities and utilities than renters, and this appears to be a unique relationship not more well explained by other variables besides home ownership itself. To further understand the relationship between home ownership, well-being, and a variety of potentially related variables, we can look to a study of Australian homeowners and renters between 2001 and 2009 from Stillman and Liang, 2010. I'm not sure how important life satisfaction is on the Maslow's hierarchy in Australia, considering the continued dominance of the first objective, which is to just survive. The Beyblade easily smashed through the bone and chair leg, sending them flying across the room. Everything about this is absolutely terrifying, especially the speed and the helicopter noise. During this time frame, home ownership rates in Australia declined from around 73% in 2001 to 2004 to 70% in 2009. Mobility seemingly also declined, with 18-20% to 20 of individuals reporting having moved in the last year in the early 2000s versus 17% in 2009, and the mean duration of their current residence increased slightly from 8.0 to 8.2 years in that span. Median housing costs also increased from 10% of household income in 2001 to 12% of household income in 2009, and that increase had the biggest effect on mortgage holders. Of course, the tail end of these data were collected as the housing bubble in the United States burst, which gives us some interesting data to later compare to the housing crisis in America. For this study, subjects were asked if they outright owned, rented, or were paying off a mortgage, as well as questions about demographics, including children and relationship status, their employment opportunities, financial situation, how safe they felt, how much they felt like part of the local community, the status of their health, the neighborhood they lived in, the amount of free time they had, and how satisfied they were with their life. The scholars found that 80% of individuals who were in a stable relationship were homeowners, compared to 50% of single individuals and 63% of subjects who had been both in a relationship and single during the years of data assessment. Similar breakdowns by relationship status were presented as it concerned employment status, as 78% of those in a stable relationship were more likely to be employed than those who remained single, 70%, or who changed relationship status, 72%. However, real total household income, when accounting for per capita bias, was similar across all groups. Further, the housing cost to income ratio was 0.15 for stable singles, 0.13 for those who changed relationship status, and 0.10 for stable couples, meaning couples are more likely to own a home and tend to spend less on paying for that home than singles or those not in a stable relationship. Couples were also generally more well-off in other variables, as their physical health was one point higher, mental health three points higher, satisfaction with family relationships one point higher, and overall life satisfaction 0.7 points higher than singles, although singles were slightly 0.2 points more satisfied with their amount of free time. Further evidence for the eternal wisdom of Patrice O'Neill. That means we want you around, but just not right in my but like, you know, in the vents, on the roof, with these basic correlations in mind, regression analysis allows us to see not just how variables are related, but how much one explains another, so Stillman and Liang constructed several models to examine these relationships. In their first model, home ownership shared a strong correlation with personal well-being across all of its forms, except for satisfaction with free time, which was negatively associated with home ownership. The strongest correlation with home ownership was between satisfaction with finances being 0.88 points higher for homeowners. Looking just at stable singles, there was no relationship between home ownership and personal well-being, physical health, mental health, satisfaction with family relationships, nor overall life satisfaction. However, it was positively and significantly related to satisfaction with one's home, satisfaction with inclusion in one's community, satisfaction with one's financial situation, and satisfaction with one's neighborhood, but not with overall life satisfaction. Satisfaction with the home was the largest correlation with owning a home in singles. Other variables regarding the home, including the region in which subjects lived and the remoteness of the location, were unrelated to the connection between home ownership and well-being, except for moving from a large city to a rural area, which was related to a 0.46 to 0.47 point increase in satisfaction with their home, 
which makes sense as typically homes in urban centers tend to cost a lot more for a lot less, hence perhaps why London has been described as a biodome for bastards. To live in London is to surround yourself with bellends. London is full, literally full, of giant 30-something toddlers that will boast about their own spurious accomplishments while ironically playing a vintage 1984 Professor Pac-Man arcade machine in the corner of a tatty, upcycled pub that only sells a single, small-batch IPA called Bukaki for £15 a bottle. They travelled there on a Segway, and they wear Pokemon backpacks, and if you shouted the word Josh at nobody in particular, the entire place would fall as still and silent as a Wild West saloon whenever a baddie walks in. London isn't really a home for these people, it's a creche. It's a hypersleep chamber that allows them to eke out their insufferable, responsibility-free student lifestyle for a good two decades longer than any normal person should. Because the thought of standing up straight and looking the world in the eye like an adult fills them with abject terror. London isn't a city anymore. It's a biodome full of bastards. In contrast to singles, home ownership for those in a stable relationship was significantly and positively correlated with satisfaction with one's home. Satisfaction with inclusion in one's community, satisfaction with one's financial situation, satisfaction with one's neighborhood, satisfaction with one's safety, satisfaction with one's family relationships, and overall life satisfaction. Much as with singles, for stable couples, home satisfaction was the variable most strongly related to home ownership. Also similarly to singles, moving out of a major city into another region was related to a 0.22 to 0.39 increase in home satisfaction in couples. So again, to reiterate the point, Biodome full of bastards. Age also played a role, albeit a small one, as a one-year increase in age produced 0.01 points more satisfaction for 40-year-olds and produced 0.02 points greater satisfaction for 50-year-olds. Again, negligible results. Time in battle, like actually playing battles, I probably have about 5,000. Christ, there's a boomer around here. <laughs> there were some other differences between people outside of their relationship status that influenced these variables. As home ownership led to greater satisfaction with one's safety for men in general, but not for women, while ownership was related to less satisfaction with free time for single women, while having no influence on single men, just some evidence that this is not just an issue of getting no bitches, but also stacking no paper. In turn, the positive effects of home ownership on personal well-being were stronger for single men than for single women, while there were no other significant gender differences for stable couples. The influence of home ownership on well-being was unrelated to the presence of children in the household, whether that household was comprised of a single person or a couple. Interestingly, satisfaction with one's home was slightly lower in stable couples who owned their home outright or paid no monthly rent compared to singles who had also paid off their house. But this was the only variable influenced by being mortgage-free across the two groups. This may be because there was some evidence that the positive effects of home ownership were stronger in new owners, such that perhaps by the time one has paid off their house in full, the positives of having purchased it in the first place have just begun to burn a little bit less brightly. And speaking of paying for the house, these scholars found only one difference between owners with high housing costs and those with low costs, which was that stable singles with more expensive homes tended to be less satisfied with their amount of free time. And again, that makes sense because they're paying for it alone. Overall, the results of this study were indicative that home ownership has a strong causal impact on satisfaction with the home and a smaller but still meaningful effect on satisfaction with local community inclusion and satisfaction with the neighborhood, as well as a much smaller but still positive influence on total life satisfaction, although that last one is affected by several other variables. If buying a home is related positively to life satisfaction, no matter how minor, but also financial satisfaction, are there still positive effects of home ownership for lower income people? Rowe and Stegman 1994 examined degrees of life satisfaction and self-esteem, among other variables, in a sample of Americans enrolled in a low-income program sponsored by the Enterprise Foundation and the City of Baltimore. Never a good sign. You, Baltimore! If you're dumb enough to buy a new car this weekend, you're a big enough schmuck to come to Big Bill Hell's car! Bad deal! Cars that break down! Thieves! If you think you're gonna find a bargain at Big Bill, you can kiss my ass! This program made home ownership available to those with incomes as low as $11,000 a year in a series of row houses that had been purchased by the city, financed through Fannie Mae, and sold on the cheap for just under $50,000, about $100,000 today adjusted for inflation. All eligible buyers received a silent mortgage of eleven dollars to be forgiven if they lived in the unit for eight years, 
making monthly payments as low as $284 a month, or $564 today, and requiring less than $900 down payment, about $1,800 today. One of the reasons I wanted to take a look at this older study in more detail is because I happen to know a little bit more about the long-term outcome of this program and those like it, having lived in Baltimore, as this was not the only scheme that the city implemented in attempts to revitalize certain areas, including a previous deal wherein the city sold row houses to investors for just $1 in the 1970s, a plan currently back on the table in 2022. The only difference being that perhaps in 2022, that's a bit overpriced if it doesn't come with a free AR-15 and a cyborg clone of Kyle Rittenhouse with which to protect your property. And so the courier who had cheated death in the cemetery outside Good Springs cheated death once again. During the same time, between the 1970s and early 90s, the city also completely rehauled its inner harbor, once a dirty center of industry into an expensive tourist trap, while nearby Fells Point, also once a center for industrial warehouses, turned into a hip hub of restaurants and shops. As such, some of those row houses that were sold for essentially $40,000 in the 1990s, if not for a dollar in the 1970s, are now worth hundreds of thousands. Although to be fair, I'm not sure exactly where all of these houses were located at. I mean, this one kind of looks like Pigtown, but I can't say for sure. Australasia, a collection of islands in the South Pacific. Reconnaissance has shown that these islands are rich in swill. <laughs> Shut up! What I can say for sure, though, is that if these houses were located in places like Federal Hill, Hamden, or Canton, the people who paid ultimately 40 grand for them in the 1990s probably made a pretty penny off of them later if they did inevitably sell. Anyway, participants in the Enterprise Foundation program were surveyed over an 18-month period, once before buying the home and then again afterwards, and their responses were compared to a sample of Baltimore residents who were recipients of Section 8 rental assistance, who served as the control group. The Section 8 program operates through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, which allows individuals to rent private housing from a landlord while being partially subsidized by the federal government via vouchers. Respondents' levels of self-esteem and their sense of internal locus of control, that is, the belief that one has the power to change the circumstances of various elements of their life through action, life satisfaction, and demographic data were collected to compare these two groups. Section 8 recipients served as an appropriate control group because both groups were low income. But while the Enterprise Foundation buyers were ultimately purchasing a home on the cheap using a degree of government assistance, those in the Section 8 program were similarly low income, but instead were using government assistance to help afford a rental property, not a home to own. In terms of the demographic data, buyers had slightly higher incomes than did Section 8 recipients, were more likely to be unmarried males, were slightly more likely to be employed, and on average, had attained some higher degrees of education, while there was no difference in race and household size between groups. At the baseline, these two groups had roughly equivalent levels of self-esteem, perceived control, and life satisfaction. After 18 months, buyers reported small increases in self-esteem, perceived control over their life, and life satisfaction, while the control group of renters showed small decreases in those measures, seemingly indicating fairly consistently that owning a home, even as a low-income earner, is positively associated with improved well-being. To rule out confounding variables, demographic characteristics, housing conditions, and neighborhood characteristics were also taken into consideration. When these variables were controlled for, self-esteem was no longer predicted by housing tenure, being either a renter or a buyer. And instead, the only significant remaining predictor of increased self-esteem was housing condition. For perceived control, once again, when statistical controls were put into place, tenure was no longer associated with that outcome, and instead, only education predicted increased internal locus of control, in that not less, but instead more educated people reported feeling less in control of their lives. So how's your life? Yeah, not bad. Steady decline. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike self-esteem and control, however, home ownership continued to remain a significant positive predictor of life satisfaction. Those with homes that they reported as being in better condition and in older respondents were also more likely to be satisfied with life. So yes, it does seem that home ownership has a unique positive effect on satisfaction, specifically in low-income people compared to renting. But in this case, we don't just have more complex, albeit sterile, statistical analyses to rely on as 85% of subjects who were asked directly just said, yeah, that they thought owning a home had made them feel better while the other 15% merely reported that home ownership had no effect. Comparatively, 71% of respondents believed owning a home gave them greater control over their lives, 27% reported no effect, 
and only 2% said that home ownership gave them less internal locus of control. Finally, when queried, if at all, how home ownership had changed their lives, 89% said that it had a positive impact, 2% said it had a negative impact, and 10% said it had no impact. In total though, it does seem that owning a home is a unique positive contributor to life satisfaction and to well-being, including in low-income people living with a mortgage. On the subject of mortgages, they can certainly put a significant strain on one's finances, even if one were to get a great deal on some admittedly not so great homes like those offered by Baltimore City in the 70s and 90s. So if one's finances are significantly strained by paying for a mortgage, is home ownership still a positive force? This question was assessed by Will and Renz 2022 utilizing data from the German Socioeconomic Panel. Subjects were asked about their general degree of life satisfaction, satisfaction with their home, details about their home, and demographic information. In this sample, being a homeowner increased housing satisfaction, but life satisfaction was not affected by home ownership, at least in the broadest sense. So what variables were mediating these relationships? Well, time seems to be significant, as these scholars found that life satisfaction peaked for renters right before buying a home, at which point it began to decline, reaching a low point between four to five years after purchase. While as renters, the lowest point for life satisfaction was between three and four years before buying a house. In contrast, immediately upon purchasing a home, housing satisfaction increased by 10% in the year directly following. And although this did decline over time, housing satisfaction remained significantly higher in homeowners than in renters even six years after purchasing. The other key variable that appeared to influence life satisfaction in this sample was paying off a loan and the loan to income ratio, both significantly and negatively. Specifically, for each 1% increase in the loan-to-income ratio, life satisfaction decreased by 2.86%, while housing satisfaction increased by 2.17%. That is, German citizens paying off a mortgage were more satisfied with their living conditions to about the same degree that they were less satisfied with their lives in general. When compared to those who took out a loan versus outright buyers, the relationship between purchasing a home and life satisfaction became more clear, as those who took out a loan were significantly higher in life satisfaction before the purchase, after which time their satisfaction was significantly lower. While life satisfaction also decreased over time for those who bought their home outright, they tended to remain happier than those who took out a loan and were about as happy as they had been before the purchase. Those who took out a loan always reported higher levels of housing satisfaction both before and after purchasing the home, compared to outright buyers. Thus, while there is evidence that owning a home increases life satisfaction, finances and mortgages clearly play a role. One of the issues with this level of data is that it doesn't contain information regarding other elements of residence before and after buying, specifically tenant status. To be able to afford purchasing a house outright, there are really only a couple of avenues towards that possibility. Having inherited a lot of wealth, having saved for a very long period of time, or most commonly, taking the cash made from selling a previous home, perhaps one that was bought through a mortgage, to purchase a new home. It's likely that outright buyers are older and not transitioning from tenancy into ownership, but instead from ownership into ownership, a flaw in this analysis that was not taken into consideration when comparing satisfaction in outright buyers and those who took out mortgages, the latter of whom may be more likely to be younger, have lower incomes, and be first-time homeowners all of which could contribute to the stress of having to pay for that mortgage, despite the massive increase in housing satisfaction. Still, it's important to keep this study in mind to help us better understand the complexity of how home ownership interacts with various forms of satisfaction in relationship to financial concerns. But also, I thought it important to bring up to illustrate why it's so important to be careful about just what is being assessed in the piece of research. But speaking of financial concerns, residents, and satisfaction, does government intervention in the form of subsidized housing affect those who live in that housing differently from those who own a home? In the United States, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, again HUD, provides very low-rent public housing owned by the federal government to over 4 million low-income families. For those who are provided with public housing, do they receive the same positive effects of home ownership as do actual homeowners, being that they are essentially renters? Would everyone be a little bit happier if the government provided them with low-cost domiciles that they weren't ever able to actually own? A pod, if you will, with a stable supply of bugs to eat. Can you in fact own nothing and be just as happy as if you did own things, as the World Economic Forum posits? Oh, oh my god. I qualmed. To try and answer that hypothetical, we can look to an assessment from Wu, Stephens, Du, and Wang 2018, that's two different people, not Du Wang. What a beaut! 
beautiful duet. Regarding subjective well-being in metropolitan residents of Beijing. Subjective well-being was assessed via a Likert-type scale of how satisfied with their lives respondents reported to be. Something to be careful about given the social credit system and the possibility of, well, this happening. <laughs> Which was compared to home ownership, family composition, individual socioeconomic characteristics, neighborhood environment, and perceived neighborhood characteristics, as well as hukou status. Hukou is a practice that was adopted by the Chinese Communist government in the 1950s to discourage citizens from overcrowding the cities. Gee, that worked out great. And assigns each individual with a kind of social credit score. Yes, this is a different and older kind of social credit score than the one that gets memed on today. When the Pope releases a patch yeah. on Catholicism yeah. that results in every f***ing purgatory baby what from you, the beginning of time what are you, until now ceasing to exist. What are you telling me the patch wrecked my save file? <laughs> And instead, hukou status prevents those who have not obtained it in any given city from being able to access public goods and services such as access to medical and unemployment insurance and affordable housing benefits of the host city. Similarly to data from the rest of the world, Wu et al. found that home ownership was related positively to subjective well-being as well as being of hukou status, something without any real direct comparison to any limitation on residents in the states or elsewhere in the world. Higher income respondents were also found to have higher levels of subjective well-being, but that effect was not significant when the authors controlled for built neighborhood characteristics, that is, the infrastructure already present in the neighborhood, rather than other perceived neighborhood characteristics. On that note, regarding perceived neighborhood characteristics, residential satisfaction, perceptions about safety, and social environment did have significant effects on residents' subjective well-being. Looking to the interaction between variables, family size, and home ownership, were positively associated with subjective well-being, meaning married families with children who owned a home were more likely to be happy. But was this the case across various types of housing in China? In 1998, the Chinese government transformed the housing system into being compromised, I mean, comprised by three segments. About 70 to 80% of housing would be affordable housing, 10 to 15% would be high standard commodity housing developed through the market to serve higher income households, and about 10 to 15% would be subsidized rental housing supported by employers or municipal governments. There are other types of housing that still fall outside of these three groups, including replacement housing, self-built housing, and low-income rental housing. The researchers found no significant interaction effects of home ownership and family size on life satisfaction for commodity housing and affording housing occupiers, while the other types of housing did affect satisfaction. And I should be clear, those other types of housing can include cobbled together shacks. In total, home ownership played the most significant role in influencing life satisfaction for commodity housing occupiers those who tended to have higher incomes and had more choice in their housing options compared to those with lower incomes, who still have a place to stay, sure, but that domicile is owned and determined by the state. So, in other words, even in China, being able to own a home as much as one can own a home in China is related to greater life satisfaction than being provided a home by the state, seemingly a complete refutation of the claims that being given a home by the government is as good as owning one and one reflected in the similar results seen in the United States' relationship to HUD and Section 8 housing. When the state makes itself God, it can giveth and taketh away, which probably doesn't lead to a lot of perceived stability in those reliant upon it. Also, what's that Live Leak logo been doing here while I was covering this subject? Speaking of things that can negatively affect your health, like a Live Leak logo, since we've looked at life satisfaction and some of the more mental health-related variables associated with owning a home, what about the physical health of homeowners, as well as other aspects of home ownership that may be related to its apparent relationship with well-being? While life satisfaction is perhaps the most commonly assessed variable in relation to home ownership, and it is a logical variable to look at first to justify making a massive life-changing purchase, it's far from the only variable that has been examined, as we covered very quickly at the start of this video. So before we delve into the specific influence of home ownership during a recession or market crisis, let's quickly look at some of the other potentially important variables associated with it. 
To better understand the non-financial benefits associated with homeownership, we can look to a study from Lindblad and Quercia 2015, utilizing data from the Community Advantage Panel Survey as well as phone interviews with homeowners and renters in 2007 and 2008, just before and towards the start of the housing market bubble crash. Participants were questioned about their degree of civic participation, including being a member of a homeowners association or neighborhood watch, voting in local elections, and talking with or being friends with neighbors, their health, including general health, physical limitations, and their mental health issues, whether they owned or rented a home, how long they had resided in their home, perceived control over one's life, also again called self-efficacy, including feeling confident in one's ability to solve life problems, and feeling as if their life was headed in the right direction due to their own effort. If their peers and family members own homes, home equity, that is, how much the unit cost to purchase versus its current value, satisfaction with the dwelling and what type of dwelling it was, as well as satisfaction with the neighborhood. In terms of neighborhood participation, direct effects assessment revealed that homeowners compared to renters were 111% more likely to be a member of a local group such as the neighborhood watch, while indirect effects were indicative that homeowners were significantly more likely to vote in local elections such that the odds of voting in the last local election were 25.4% higher for homeowners than for renters. And this followed through, again, indirectly based on the number of years lived in the domicile. Home ownership of peers and family was unrelated to owning versus renting, meaning these positive effects may not be related to familial or generational wealth. Homeowners were healthier, and although this relationship was partially mediated by perceived control over one's life, the relationship was both direct and indirect as mediated through that perception in that greater perception of control was associated with a 7% reduction in the likelihood that a homeowner would be limited in some activities due to physical health issues compared to renters. Further, home ownership indirectly reduced the odds that a subject would report a mental or emotional health issue within the past four weeks by 15%. These positive effects were not unilateral across all homeowners, however, as participants who lived in a detached single-family home, that is a house not sharing a wall with another occupied home, reported significantly lower general health than those who owned condominiums, apartments, townhomes, or other housing structures. Similarly, detached housing reduced participation in neighborhood groups by 65%. Both of these findings are indicative that owners of homes in the picturesque suburban cul-de-sac do not receive some of the same benefits, both social and physical, as those who live in attached homes, being quite literally closer to their neighbors. Although I would hypothesize that these results may be because owners of detached homes may tend to be a little bit older, and thus in a bit of worse health than younger people in general who might be more likely to live in a townhome or a condominium. There's this connection that I feel to the apartment, and I am a great neighbor. Just ask anyone in my building, except Rahim. I turned him into Homeland Security by accident. <laughs> There was also a significant indirect effect of home ownership on physical and mental health through a sense of control on high and medium home equity. However, perceived control played no role in homes low in equity. That is, people whose homes have low or negative equity, being worth less than when it was purchased, do not receive the positive health benefits otherwise experienced by homeowners. The cost of housing had no effect on any of these variables, meaning that there were positive mental and physical health outcomes for owners of any home, regardless of how expensive it was. In total then, for all three health outcomes and for all civic engagement outcomes, home ownership was a consistent predictor, even when including possible confounds. Another analysis from Finnegan 2014 can allow us to get a little bit more information regarding possible differences between home ownership and physical and mental health outcomes, specifically racial disparities. In the United States, according to census data, white people are more than 1.5 times more likely to own a home, depending on the year of assessment, than are black and Hispanic Americans. So we should ask, does home ownership affect Americans of different racial or ethnic backgrounds differently? Which was the question that Finnegan sought to answer using data from the 2012 Current Population Survey. Self-reported health, race, and ethnicity, and speaking of self-reported race, look at it you Sean King, housing tenure, characteristics of the residents, and other demographic information was collected. Among all households, the proportion of subjects who reported good health was 3.5% higher among homeowners compared to renters. Hispanic homeowners did not report better health than Hispanic renters, and the positive relationship between health and home ownership was strongest in white owners, followed by Asian owners, with Black Americans receiving the fewest benefits in terms of physical health improvement based on these mere correlations. If we look instead to regression analysis, homeowners once again had higher probabilities of good health than renters by 2.5%. However, both black and Asian household heads reported significantly lower probabilities of good health than white ones, while there was no difference between white subjects and Latinos in the first model. 
When controls were added to the second model, this relationship increased to 3.1% higher chance of reporting good health in homeowners compared to renters. In the third and fourth models, with even more variables added, results were indicative that white owners were 3.7% more likely to report good health, black owners were 2.3% more likely to report good health, and Latino and Asian homeowners were between 1.2 and 1.9% respectively more likely to report good health compared to renters, with the effect being most pronounced in white residents between 2.2% and 6% higher than in other groups. Although in general home ownership was associated with better physical health, it carried nearly twice the influence in low-income owners, at 6% compared to the 3.1% increase in physical health seen in the total population. The effect was more pronounced in low-income owners of all races, although the difference fell just short of statistical significance in Latinos. When including the variables of existing health issues and having a disability, white homeowners exhibited a significant health advantage over white renters. Black homeowners reported a smaller but significant health advantage over black renters, but have a non-significant health disadvantage when excluding the disabled and those in poor health. There was no difference for Latino and Asian Americans between renting and owning with these other variables taken into consideration. Thus, home ownership seems to be broadly associated with greater physical health across groups, although this association is strongest in white people and can be influenced by several other factors, including income, health problems, and disability. In other words, owning a home is seemingly good for everyone, but perhaps most beneficial for white people. White people, yay! Home ownership may not only improve one's physical and mental health, it may have a positive effect on the neighborhood around one in general, which we can look at in more detail in a study from Lindblad and Mantrook, 2013, utilizing data from the Community Advantage program collected between 2006 and 2007. The goal of this program is to purchase conventional, fixed-rate prime mortgages that were given to low- to moderate-income families who, given their credit profile, would otherwise have received a subprime mortgage or been unable to purchase a home at all. Subjects were asked about the problems facing their neighborhood, their sense of collective efficacy in being able to do something to mitigate those problems, the sense of community that they believed was present in their neighborhood, how likely neighbors might be to help, and various demographic questions. In their factor analysis, these scholars found that a sense of community contributed slightly to more collective efficacy than informal social control. Structural equation modeling illustrated that subjects' perceptions of neighborhood crime and disorder was impacted by two variables neighborhood disadvantage and collective efficacy. Specifically, neighborhood disadvantage, that is, having more single parents, unemployed persons, those on public assistance, or in poverty, was related positively to crime and neighborhood disorder. In contrast, collective efficacy, which is a feeling that the community would be able to improve neighborhood conditions, was related negatively to crime and neighborhood disorder. Home ownership exerted a positive direct effect on collective efficacy as homeowners scored an average of 0.18 points higher than renters on the instrument. There was an indirect effect of home ownership on neighborhood disorder as mediated then through home ownership's relationship to increased collective efficacy. As such, more home ownership in an area does not necessarily decrease the level of crime in that area, but when residents believe that they are collectively, as a community, able to make some positive change in reducing crime, that crime and disorder does tend to be diminished. How can this be for the greater good? The greater good. Shut it! If home ownership can improve a neighborhood, even if indirectly, and seems to be a positive influence on homeowners both mentally and physically, are children who grow up in homes better off than those who grow up in rental properties? Borassa Horan and Hoesley 2015 examined outcomes for children aged 15 through 24 in Switzerland, which I understand is a bit like looking at a study of the children of Mirkwood as being broadly generalizable, but let's look at it anyway. These children were raised either in homes or in other types of housing, and data were collected from the Swiss Federal Statistical Office's 1998 Survey of Income and Consumption. Compared to the United States, a relatively smaller portion of the Swiss population are homeowners rather than renters. They found a significant effect of occupant density on education outcomes. Specifically, if the density per room were increased by 10%, the probability of being in high school would be reduced by 9%. By the way, by density here, I'm referring to the number of people staying in a room, not other common measures of Swiss density, such as Toblerone per Alp or spicy German gold per floorboard. Neither ownership nor dwelling type influenced the education attainment of a student. Given that Swiss students are required to have completed high school in order to attend university, we could reasonably speculate then that this 9% decrease in high school attendance would correlate to about a 9% reduction in university attendance, at a minimum. Overall, the researchers identified no effect of home ownership or dwelling type on the educational attainment of either age group, 
However, they did find a relatively large effect of crowding in the dwelling on educational outcomes for the group aged 15 through 19. While this could be a unique effect in Switzerland, given the greater number of renters there, at least according to these data, home ownership is not a determinant of completing education in young people. Other home conditions, namely crowding, are, at least, again, for the Swiss. What makes a man turn neutral? Lust for gold? Yeah. Outside of completing high school or even college, does family background influence the likelihood that young people will become homeowners themselves? While it may seem like a kind of no-duh question, it's still one worth asking. Aust 2012 analyzed data collected from the Swedish Housing and Life Course Cohort Study. So we're moving from one neutral country to a neutral country. <laughs> <laughs> Using a sample of individuals born in 1956, 1964, and 1974 and surveyed in 2005, subjects were asked if by the time that they were 25, whether or not their parents owned a home, if they were single or married, the occupation and socioeconomic status of their father or their mother if the subject came from a single mother home, demographic data, as well as their current housing tenure status. Results were indicative that parents' home ownership seems to play a primary role in determining whether the children would themselves become homeowners. Results were not identical for all cohorts, as young adults born in 1964 and 1974 were significantly more sensitive to changes in the potential wage rate than the cohort born in 1956. Further, the impact of parental home ownership was larger in 1974 than in the earlier two birth years assessed. There were no significant differences across birth years in the influence of single mother households and father's socioeconomic status. As such, yes, having parents who own a home does somewhat seem to increase the odds that young people themselves will become homeowners, although other variables, like being the child of a single mother, do tend to weaken this relationship. Evidence, perhaps, that the thing most commonly passed down from a single mother to her children is some form of mild trauma. Come on, man! I'm just saying, based on that story that you just told me, I'm fairly certain that those Santas were running a train on your mom for money. No, dude, they, they would just give my mom money and go in the- uh. Further, it seems that the relationship itself was waning over time, which is perhaps unsurprising as the cost of housing has increased so much in past decades. Which brings us to another important question about home ownership. Do massive increases in home costs, such as those experienced during a housing market crash, like that which Americans experienced in 2008, and we appear to be headed towards again, significantly change the benefits associated with owning a home? With inflation reaching 40-year highs in the US, and the cost of living, including the cost of buying a home, skyrocketing, we should better understand how price acceleration in the housing market influences transition from renting into ownership, given that it seems owning a home is a positive factor on well-being, both mental and physical. And we can get a better idea of how housing tenure changes with price increases by looking to a study from Sissons and Houston 2019 who examined rising house costs in Britain between 1991 and 2013, utilizing data from the British Household Panel Survey. During this time frame, the median cost of a home in Britain increased from about £60,000 in 1991 to more than double, nearly £140,000 in 2013. Local housing prices, interregional mobility and interdistrict mobility, duration of time spent as a renter, household wealth, occupation, mortgage interest rate, first-time buyer loan-to-value ratio, expected interest rates, and house price expectations were all measured as control variables. They found, as we might expect, that as housing prices increased, the number of people moving from renters to owners decreased. While there was no relationship between local housing costs and ownership in the 1990s, in the 2000s there was a significant negative relationship between housing costs and moving from renting to owning. While in the 90s, having rented for five or more years was associated with 0.18 odds of prolonged duration of renting, in the 2000s, this ratio increased to 0.43, meaning that it became less likely for renters to become owners as the cost of housing increased and thus making renting more sticky. That is, the longer one stayed a renter, the more difficult it became to get out of renting and into ownership, creating perennial renters. Previously, in the 1990s, moving to a cheaper district was associated positively with greater odds of becoming a homeowner, while there was no such relationship between moving to a less costly region and homeownership in the 2000s. In other words, one couldn't escape by simply moving to the countrysides. The stranger's not local. He wears a crown and builds a new road. 
In the 90s, 23 to 34 year olds and 35 to 44 year olds were no more likely to cease renting and move into ownership than those aged 16 to 24. But by the 2000s, 16 to 24 year olds were significantly less likely to become owners than 25 to 44 year olds. Finally, in the 90s, there was no difference in moving from renting to buying between those employed in a professional or non-professional occupation. But in the 2000s, seemingly only those in professional positions were buying homes illustrating the rise of the young professional or yuppie class. As such, while it surely mustn't come as much of a surprise, as the cost of housing goes up, people are less able to afford homes and thus end up renting for longer, ending up often in a rut where they cannot escape renting, and as such, will often not experience the positive effects of home ownership. He has to work really hard just to afford the rent in a crack house. He works in this, he lives in this place that's just perpetually on fire. <laughs> If home ownership is so seemingly positive in relationship to life satisfaction, then we need to ask the question, well, how was that satisfaction influenced by a financial crisis? As mentioned earlier, homeowners lack the mobility of renters, and as such may end up stuck in a house they wish to vacate but simply because of sunk cost, do not. So how does the economy influence satisfaction with ownership versus renting? For answers, we can look to a study from Mantruk, Riley, and Radcliffe, 2012, who utilized data from a sample of lower-income borrowers who had obtained an affordable mortgage through the Community Advantage Program. And a separate sample of renters collected during the 2009 financial crisis, which we should probably talk about just for a moment because it's not only relevant to this study and this video in general, but to just better understand the current problems with the cost of housing and cost of living in general, much as we've seen in 2022. One of the major reasons for the housing market crash of 2008 was financial flippancy with mortgages, which were being handed out to people who, in the face of really any disruption to any of their financial stability or lack thereof, were simply unable to afford. In 2009, the median borrower's income was just under $31,000 per year while the median mortgage was 79,000. More than two thirds of the loans at this time had an original loan to value in excess of 95%, which is calculated by the amount of money loaned divided by the total cost of the property. So to reach that 95% loan to value calculation seen in two thirds of loan recipients, that would mean a person buying a home priced at $150,000 was putting down only $7,000 if not less. Taking the median values, that meant that the majority of home buyers were actually setting aside just about $3,000 for a home that cost about $80,000. Using the 28% rule, which is generally considered a good metric by which to gauge what is manageable as a mortgage cost, that would leave the median owner with a yearly mortgage of a bit over eight grand a year or about $720 a month on a 10-year mortgage plan. Despite that 28% rule though, the average mortgage in the United States is 30 years, which of course nets banks the most interest, but also would put the monthly cost of paying off that median $80,000 home at just over $200 a month for buyers in the late 2000s. Typically, any loan to value ratio over 80% is considered a risky investment. But again, this was the norm before the bubble burst of 2008. And I would say thanks Obama, but that was really more of a Clinton and Bush product. Obama. To compound the problem of risky and I would say predatory loans being the status quo for home buyers at the time, almost half of the borrowers had original credit scores of 660 or less, and many had no credit score at all. Meaning the writing was really all over the wall in big red letters that the people being given these massive loans for the most part really couldn't afford to or be expected to pay them off. But if you want an answer as to why it may be that so much data from before 2008 were illustrative of the positive relationships between well-being and home ownership? Well, yeah, part of that may be financial if only because the nature of loans at the time meant most owners were contributing less than 10% of their monthly income into paying for housing, provided they were on a 30-year mortgage at a 95% loan-to-value ratio, as so many were. With this in mind, and going back to Mantruk, Riley, and Ratcliffe's analysis, both renters and homeowners were asked about their levels of stress, both financial and personal, as well as their financial satisfaction during this tumultuous period of time. Home ownership was associated with a 0.52 point reduction in general stress. Contrary to the notion that wealthier people are less stressed, this model was indicative that people with higher incomes have more stress, rather than less, including having more stress specifically related to finances. Although that might sound strange, Think back to that loan to value ratio and how mortgages were being passed out like candy for people making 30 grand a year. For those who make more money, they also tended to have easier access to credit to make bigger purchases, hence often accumulating more debt, meaning more of their income was tied up in managing that debt. 
So for example, if one instead were to purchase a million dollar home, and by the way, depending on where you live, that doesn't necessarily buy you much, on a 30-year mortgage, with that 95% loan-to-value ratio, the average monthly payment would be over $2,600. And to hit that 28% rule of thumb for a relatively safe portion of income going towards housing, the owner of that home should really have a monthly household income of about $10,000, which is just about a third of American households as of 2022 who meet that threshold. As such, of course, just going by pure numbers, having a mortgage that's 13 times higher than the mortgage for the medium home owner, in the same time frame, even if you earn four times as much as the median owner, your money, again, despite having more of it, can actually tend to be spread a lot thinner, which is likely why this study found that people who had experienced an unexpected expense were more likely to feel financially stressed than those who had not, whether they owned a home or rented. Overall, however, homeowners were 60% more likely to report a higher level of satisfaction with their financial situation than a renter. But interestingly, financial satisfaction was unrelated to the market crisis and was similarly unrelated to income at a nationwide level, although there were some variations by state. Specifically, people living in the South were significantly more likely to feel satisfied with their financial situation than those living in other regions, which makes sense as the financial situation in those states tended to fare a bit better and be a bit more stable during this time, compared to states such as California, which as of 2009 had seen a 30% decline in property values since 2006, and the number of households with mortgages 90 days or more overdue being double that of North Carolina and Oklahoma the latter of which also had the lowest unemployment rates at the time at just 6%, while California had the highest unemployment rates. What we can take away from this analysis, then, is that home ownership remains stable even during problems with the housing market, and when you calculate in the importance of neighborhood and community in life satisfaction, it's questionable as to why anyone would live in California, hence, perhaps, the mass migration. What do you think about California? You like it? Yeah. Do you like it? You taking a shit? Even if satisfaction is elevated in homeowners, though, how else do crises in the residential sector influence individuals' mental health? Well, Dwyer et al. 2016 utilized the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth 1997, which periodically collects data on young adults who were predominantly high school juniors in 1997, to analyze relationships between their home ownership status and mental health before and then during the housing crisis. So between 2006 and 2008, this cohort was on average between 24 and 26 years old during the two years of assessment. While home ownership for the 25 to 34 age group in the United States historically has hovered around 45%, it increased in the 2006 boon to nearly 50% before falling under 40% by 2015. So if these young people did own a home, it was in the first year of this assessment that they were most likely to do so. Respondents were polled on how often in the last month they felt calm and peaceful, had been a nervous person, felt depressed, had been a happy person, and felt down or blue on a scale ranging from all of the time to none of the time. No one will have the endurance to collect on his insurance. Lloyds of London will be loaded when they go. Additionally, mortgage indebtedness, housing distress, including whether the respondent was underwater on their mortgage, and whether they were ever significantly late on payments in 2007 and 2008, and being near default or even foreclosure were all assessed. For most of the years between 2001 and 2006, only about 10% of young homeowners reported being underwater on their mortgage. But in 2007, this jumped to almost 50% and remained there into 2008. Before the bubble burst, home ownership, including mortgaged homes, reduced anxiety by 0.055 points on a 0 to 5 point scale. After the start of the crisis, this reduction in anxiety decreased to 0.015 points. For non-owners, general anxiety increased by 0.042 points after the recession, while for mortgaged homeowners, this nearly doubled, increasing by 0.082 points. Respondents enrolled in college, those who were employed and who had higher incomes, tended to have lower anxiety. But losing income over the course of data collection was unrelated to anxiety, which may be because young adults expected to change jobs more frequently at a young age and thus are less negatively affected by some losses in income. Being married and getting older both reduce stress, while being a parent increased anxiety, understandably. There is only one thing worse than a rapist. Boom. A child. No. Women tended to be slightly higher in anxiety, perhaps a variable related to parenting. And let me see what you have! No! While minority respondents reported less stress, 
The anxiety reducing effect of holding a mortgage before the recession was about the same size as the effect of being married and also about the same size as the increase in anxiety produced by owing consumer debt, but in the opposite balance. The influence of holding a mortgage on anxiety was smaller than the influence of baseline mental health issues, meaning having a mortgage during the housing crisis was less influential on well-being than having an existing mental health problem. Overall, the anxiety-reducing effect of mortgage home ownership in young adults fell to near zero in the immediate aftermath of the recession. And while being late on a mortgage increased anxiety, the decrease in relationship between having a mortgage and positive mental health outcomes existed even in those who were financially secure in their mortgage, perhaps indicating that societal-level changes in housing security can still lead to increased anxiety, even in those who aren't personally struggling with finances. It seems, though, that mortgages are like periods, in that the later you get, the more worried you are. We live in a period. As the cost of living has gone up, so too has the cost of essentially being able to earn a living, as the cost of college tuition at four-year institutions in undergraduate degree programs, a degree required for most professional careers, have also persistently increased exponentially in cost over time. As such, as of 2022, 34% of adults aged 18 to 29 have some student debt, and are more than twice as likely to have an outstanding student loan than those in other age groups. With this debt in mind, does the increasing cost of college and the increasing prevalence of student loan debt in young people influence home ownership during periods of recession or housing crisis? Price 2016 utilized data from the Survey of Consumer Finances and tracked student loan debt and home ownership between the years of 2004 and 2013 to assess how student debt specifically influenced purchasing a home. Price found no effect of significant changes in home ownership likelihood for student loan debt holders compared with non-holders between 2004 and 2013. However, the likelihood of having a loan and the loan amount were statistically significantly higher in 2013 than they had been in 2004 across all groups, suggesting that having any amount of student debt actually played little role in home ownership. When looking at the data more closely, though, it did appear that having any outstanding student loans did negatively influence the individual likelihood of being able to purchase a home, but that this association was minor and had not changed much despite overall decreases in home ownership between the years of data assessment. Despite the negative influence of boomers, thereby millennials and Gen Z continued to buy homes despite their existing student loan debt that placed them at financial disadvantage, even if owning a home was a psychological boon. Of course, the next logical question to ask is then, if the mere presence of a student loan plays little role in home ownership, does the amount of loan debt influence that relationship? Modeling was indicative that for every $10,000 of outstanding student loan debt held, the overall likelihood of owning a home decreased by 4.2% specifically for non-white respondents. And although, much like the total population, overall home ownership did not decline over this time period, for non-white participants, outstanding student loan debt did significantly negatively influence the likelihood of home ownership. For those who had not completed a degree, the likelihood of owning a home decreased by 3.5% for each additional $10,000 in debt held. However, this trend did not change between 2004 and 2013. There were changes instead in those who had completed any degree, with every $10,000 worth of debt being associated with a 2.9% decrease in likely home ownership in 2004, but was only related to a 1.4% decrease in 2013 and a 1.5% decrease specifically in those with four-year college degrees. As such, even though the cost of housing was going up, degree holders with student debt were more likely to own a home in 2013 following the market crisis than they had been in 2004. As such, while student loans themselves may have some minor influence on decreased home ownership, it seems that trends tend to follow general trends in home ownership levels present at population levels. And although the average amount of student debt has majorly increased since 2013 by about $3,000 on average per student, it increased by about $10,000 on average between 2004 and 2013. And thus, based on these data, student loan debt does decrease the likelihood of home ownership but it does so only in the context of broader trends in the economy and home ownership levels. Considering the increasing costs of not just consumer goods, but vehicles, schooling, and ultimately housing, how do periods of recession and economic strife influence young people's faith in the system and their hopes for the future? Even if the housing bubble burst of 2008 didn't have an extreme effect on home ownership in young people, including those who held significant student loan debts, it did diminish the likelihood of home ownership in that group and kind of across the board. 
Is it possible that as we enter another serious period of economic downturn, that young people in particular will essentially give up on the American dream and become resigned to renting, rather than aiming for the increasingly costly hope of home ownership? Well, MISSEC 2012 queried undergraduate students at the University of Oregon on their type of housing tenure, current economic environment, and its relationship to their housing situation, beliefs about the current and future states of the economy, views on home ownership as an investment, opinions on the benefits and disadvantages of home ownership, experience with mortgage default, future housing intentions, their perceptions of home ownership as part of the American dream, and various questions about demographic data to understand opinions towards home ownership in millennials in the wake of the bursting of the housing bubble. Of this sample, 52% of respondents believed it was a very good or somewhat good time to purchase a home, which it was demonstrably. At the time, as housing prices reached their lowest price in decades between 2009 and 2012, before entering another bubble of growth, which 43% of subjects did not predict, anticipating prices would remain stable. In contrast, 34%, the largest portion of students, expected mortgages to increase, and 57% believed that rent would go up. Only 14% were optimistic about their own financial situation improving. 77% believed it would be somewhat or very difficult to obtain a mortgage upon graduation, of which 40% reported a low income as being the primary barrier to being accepted for a mortgage, while 22% were concerned about a lack of money for a down payment. Despite their proximity to the collapse of the housing bubble, 83% of respondents still believed that buying a home was a somewhat or very safe investment. Of the rationales undergraduate students said was most important for home ownership, the most common response was having a place to raise children, 81%, followed by having a place to feel safe, 78%, having control over one's living space, 75%, simply having more space in general, 72%, and just having a nicer home, 62%. The least commonly reported reasons were being able to borrow against the home, 16%, tax benefits, 19%, and being motivational for civic behavior, 24%. In terms of the major reasons not to own a home, the most common rationale was cost of upkeep, 51%, followed by a belief that it was cheaper to rent than to buy, 40%, and that owning a home would limit flexibility, 39% while the least commonly reported major reasons for not owning a home were a belief that renting allows one to live in a better neighborhood, 7%, feeling that one's money would be better invested somewhere else, 17%, and that buying a home was just too complicated to figure out, 19%. Still, a slight majority of 56% felt that owning would make more sense at the present time due to it being a better investment, compared to 32% who felt that renting made more sense. At the same time, 76% said they would prefer to own a home compared to 24% who said they would prefer to rent. In terms of open-ended responses given by respondents as to why they would prefer to rent, mobility was a common theme, with statements such as, Because you know you will not be staying in a particular area and don't want to get tied down by owning a house when you know within the next few years you will be relocating. Several noted the relevance of their current life stage, which was likely to change soon. For example, one participant stated, I am a grad student uh, and don't plan to live here for too long. Down payments are too high to buy a house for a couple of years. I will buy when I'm in a more permanent location. Others mentioned issues of upkeep involved with owning a home, such as, If it falls apart, it isn't your problem. While others similarly wrote about the cost of owning a home compared to renting. These four concerns, mobility, life stage, cost, and upkeep, comprised 97% of the issues given for preferring rent over ownership. In contrast, the most common reason given by those who believed ownership was preferable over renting was investment, with subjects expressing sentiments such as Renting is throwing money away and you get nothing upon moving out. The second and third most common rationales were stability and freedom, with respondents making statements such as You own it. You can do with it what you please. Of this sample, only a quarter of students knew anyone who had defaulted on a mortgage, and only 2% had a personal experience with defaulting. Given the unstable financial situations of many of these students, it should come as little surprise that 92% said that if they moved now, that they would rent rather than seek to purchase a home. But when asked to consider what they would want to do a year after graduation, 84% maintained a preference for renting. And ultimately, 98% stated that they plan to own a home at some point in their life. Of the students who already owned a home, so likely older students, a quarter did express being open to renting in the future. When asked about what the American dream was exactly, 42% of subjects explicitly mentioned owning a home, which was the most common theme. 
followed by having a family, expressed by 38% of respondents, and having a job, expressed by 33%. A mere 1% of subjects referred to the American dream as a myth when asked to describe their perception of it in detail. As such, while the American dream may have become less and less attainable over time, it doesn't appear that American young people have abandoned all hope in it, even as of the housing crisis of 2008. So, now that we are standing at the precipice of a new potential housing bubble, only time will tell if that dream will remain stable, and if and when that bubble will burst. So with all of that in mind, let's come to a few conclusions. Over the course of this video, we saw the strong and persistent relationship between home ownership and life satisfaction, and that this relationship was not just the case for the ultra-wealthy living in multi-million dollar villas, like the Twitch socialist elite, but instead actually applies most strongly for low-income people, who seem to attain a level of independence via home ownership that makes their lives just a little bit better, at least compared to renting. It's not just life satisfaction, as health, both physical and mental, is seemingly also positively influenced by owning a home. And home ownership also has positive implications for community well-being, as well as for the future of children, both in terms of education and for their own home ownership. Even during a housing crisis, when the value of one's own home is often in flux, owning a house continues to be a positive net benefit across the board. Although there are differences between different groups of people, Overall, the findings are fairly consistent. Home ownership is a pretty good thing. And with the cost of housing growing year by year, it's a good thing that's becoming increasingly out of reach for many Americans, and potentially people all over the world as we see global economic downturns. But hey, what do you guys think? Would you rather rent a house than bother with some of the dangers and costs of home ownership? Or is having a place to truly call your own worth all of the hassle? How might increasing housing costs influence younger generations who may be less able to afford a home, if at all? How might we fix the problems of expanding costs of home ownership? Or can they even be fixed? I know that's a big question, so let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. And while you are down there, if you have enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like and subscribe if you're not already subscribed, as well as hit that bell button to be notified when I upload one of these long videos, which as you can probably imagine, take a while to put together. If for some reason you do want to see more of me, I do two live shows a week, Broken Crown, which covers current events with my co-host Spoon, every Wednesday at 8 p.m. GMT, 3 p.m. EST, and Rolling in the Isles, which is a weekly tabletop role-playing game I play with Uzulu and Kami Mark. Both linked down below, along with a link to my merch store, which has new stuff for all of my ongoing projects. Finally, you can find a link to my sponsor, Yours App, down in the description and in the pinned comment. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope it has been somewhat helpful, if nothing else, while we navigate these uncertain times. Also, sorry that this video took a little bit longer to come out than usual. It's because over the last month or so, I've been moving into a new house. So I thought it was an appropriate time to do this video. Take care of yourselves out there, friends. And as always, Altana Volt. Oh,